The War of the Five Kings started with a brilliant campaign by Robb Stark. His feint at the Green Fork forced Tywin Lannister out of position, while the subsequent Battle of Whispering Woods and the Battle of the Camps led to the capture of Jaime Lannister and the raising of the Siege of Riverrun, introducing Westeros to the young wolf in a spectacular fashion. In this video, the Starks will continue their fight against the Lannisters, but new players will also enter the field of battle, adding to the uncertainty and making the war even more chaotic. Welcome to our video on the battles of Oxcross, Fords and Storm's End. Maneuver and initiative might have been Robb Stark's route to victory, but there's always another way. Feed your guys better than they feed theirs. Armies march on their stomachs, and actually so does everyone else. We've got an easy way to keep your march to victory going with HelloFresh. This service delivers fresh food to your home within a week of it leaving the farm, but specifically, they deliver precisely what is needed to create dishes on their meal plan. You pick items from their menu beforehand, now featuring a new Mediterranean range, and then follow foolproof recipes to create rich meals without a second thought. They offer vegetarian, pescatarian and fitness focus menus too, so you can dine according to your wants and needs with all the admin taken care of for you. And it's all top of the line flavorful picks with seasonal tastes mixed in and plenty of kid friendly recipes too. You'll waste no more precious weeknight time sourcing and planning meals, waste no more food throwing away unused ingredients since you get the right amount to begin with, and waste no more money. HelloFresh is up to 72% cheaper than getting food from restaurants or grocery stores. Use our link or go to hellofresh.com and use code POGWWSEPT16 for 16 free meals across 7 boxes and 3 surprise gifts. It is the year 298 after conquest. Tywin Lannister, learning of the capture of his son and the defeat of his besieging forces at Riverrun, began retreating to Harrenhal, an easily defended fortress of immense proportions, despite its burning by the dragons in the early stages of the Targaryen conquest. He wanted to reassess his forces and strategy. However, his forces continued to be harassed by the Brotherhood Without Banners during this retreat. News had also reached both the Stark and Lannister camps that the Baratheon brothers had raised their own respective forces and looked set to claim their eldest brother's throne for themselves. Stannis, who considered himself a legitimate heir by way of seniority due to the infidelity of Cersei, was one of the most capable commanders in Westeros, but could only muster a paltry force as he only controlled Dragonstone and the loyalty of the majority of the Storm Lords belonged to Renly. The younger Baratheon brother was also engaged to Marjorie Tyrell, and so could call upon the might of the Reach and the majority of the Stormlands in his claim to the Iron Throne. Many thought that he would make a far better king than the harsh and uncompromising Stannis. This news would, however, pale in comparison to the events which transpired in the capital. Eddard Stark, who was imprisoned by the forces loyal to Cersei, was offered an ultimatum to confess his crimes and join the Night's Watch, renouncing his titles and Lordship of the North, or face execution for his alleged treason against the Crown. He accepted this ultimatum, hoping it would guarantee the lives and well-treatment of his daughters. Eddard was taken to the Sept of Baelor in full view of an onlooking crowd in order to confess his crimes and openly accept King Joffrey's offer. The prisoner did just that for the sake of his family effectively giving up his much-valued honour. He and all in attendance would be stunned by the reaction of the supposed King of the Seven Kingdoms. My mother wishes me to let Lord Eddard join the Night's Watch. Stripped of all titles and powers, he would serve the realm in permanent exile. And my Lady Sansa has begged mercy for her father. But they have the soft hearts of women. So long as I am your King, treason shall never go unpunished, Sir Illyn. Bring me his head! To the extreme shock of Cersei, Varys and the High Septon, Sir Illyn Payne made his way to the despondent Eddard before beheading him with his own Valerian steel greatsword, Ice. Eddard's head was placed upon a pike, and this event changed the complexion of the war in its entirety. This event sent ripples across Westeros, making any hope that peace might be achieved far-fetched. The men of the North who had followed their liege lord's son Rob south in order to save the now deceased Eddard became vengeful in the extreme, 
removing Rob's uncertainty as to whether he should support Renly. Casting off the yoke of the Iron Throne, the Northerners and Riverlords swore fealty to Rob Stark, now choosing to create their own sovereign nation, regaining the independence lost with the coming of the Targaryens. Eddard's bastard, Jon Snow, hearing of his father's execution, also attempted to leave Castle Black and join his half-brother, but was convinced to stay by his new brothers within the Night's Watch. Rob's first act was to send Theon Greyjoy to meet with his father Balin to persuade the Ironborn to join his cause in return for the independence of the Iron Islands. Unfortunately for Rob, Balin had his own plans that would unfold in the months to come. At this point, Renly Baratheon claimed the kingship at Highgarden, placing him on a collision course with his older brother Stannis, and Rob decided to send his mother Catelyn to negotiate with him. Renly had been marching his gargantuan host along the Rose Road towards King's Landing, bringing with him his young bride and the flower of the forces of Highgarden. Stannis, despite having fewer troops, was not one to back down and marched towards Storm's End. Tywin, who Joffrey appointed as his hand, learned of these events very soon and hitched his hopes that the rivalry between the two brothers would last for some time, giving him an opportunity to deal with Robb Stark. Still, he had to find a way to stabilize the situation in King's Landing, and to that end, he sent his younger son Tyrion to the capital to take up the role of acting hand. Tywin despised his son, but knew that he was capable. Meanwhile, at the same time, the young wolf had followed up his coronation at Riverrun by driving much of the Lannister forces from the Red Fork of the Trident in a number of skirmishes, freeing the lands of his new subjects from Lannister subjugation as he met little in the way of resistance due to the Lannisters aforementioned retreat to Harrenhal. Rob left the defence of Riverrun in the hands of his uncle, Edmer Tully, ordering him to defend the castle. Edmer was incompetent, and Rob knew that, so he kept him out of the loop of his plans, and that would play a significant role in future events. The young king once more displayed his tactical acumen by recognizing that Harrenhal was too well fortified, even in its ruined state, to be attacked directly. This necessitated a new strategy in order to draw the cunning Tywin from his position of power, and that strategy was conceived in the form of a limited invasion of the Lannister homeland. This surprised the Lannister army, which was gathering at Oxcross under Sir Stafford Lannister to replace that which had been lost at the Battle of the Camps. Tywin was planning to use Sir Stafford's army as an anvil for his hammer in an attack on the Riverlands, but for now, it was just beginning to gather its strength. Its 4,000-strong core consisted of the survivors of the Battle of the Camps, led by Sir Forley Prester. It is possible that another 6 to 10,000 had joined this new army, training a few days' march from the Lannister capital of Casterly Rock. Rob wasn't going to let this new force become a threat, though and in his usual fashion, decided to take the initiative. To that end, he left most of his footmen behind, and with 6,000 horsemen, started to march towards the Lannister territory. The Westerlands were divided from the Riverlands by a chain of mountains, and most of the paths across these mountains were protected by Lannister fortresses. One of them, called the Golden Tooth, was occupied by Sir Forley and half of his troops. Rob knew that he couldn't lose time besieging this fortress, as that would alert both Tywin and Sir Stafford, who might attack him from both sides. So the Stark forces began looking for undefended hidden passes. Luckily for Rob, his direwolf, Grey Wind, managed to discover one such path, and this allowed Stark forces to enter the Westerlands undetected. Sir Stafford wasn't expecting to be attacked, so there were no sentries around his camp. Rob decided to attack in the night, and ever an opportunist, found another way to gain an advantage. Grey Wind was set loose against the Lannister horses around the camp, and the scent of the direwolf drove the horses mad. Poor animals broke their enclosure, some running away, some charging directly at the camp of their masters. This in turn caused mass panic among the Lannister forces. Some of them attempted to create a battle line around the core of veterans, but the majority started to run. The young wolf sent his entire army against the enemy and added to its panic. The Lannister leader was killed almost immediately, and soon after, the untrained Westerland army was crushed. 
We don't know the exact numbers, but it seems that up to 10,000 Lannister warriors died or were taken prisoner, while the Stark casualties were very few. Unwilling to rest on his laurels, Rob once more pressed upon the Lannisters' neck, sensing their current precarious situation. He knew that he didn't have enough troops to take Casterly Rock, so instead he decided to scour the Westerlands, hoping that this will dislodge Tywin from his well-fortified position in Harrenhal. First, Rob took the seat of House Marbrand, the castle of Ashmark, and three of the surrounding gold mines. As that didn't lure Tywin out, the young wolf continued raiding, this time attacking the seat of House Westerling, the Crag. In short order, it was stormed at night, with Stark troops scaling over the walls. Rob, displaying his continued courage, led from the front, breaking down the main gate with a ram before taking an arrow wound. The Crag was taken soon but the injury slowed down Rob. Fortunately for him, he was now being tended to by Lady Jane Westerling. Meanwhile, Tywin finally realized that he can't leave his base of power undefended, and as he wasn't yet worried about the Baratheon brothers, left Harrenhal, betting that he still had time. However, the size of his host immediately alerted Edmer Tully to his movements, and in response, he commanded Sir Helmand Tullhart to leave the twins and join with Lord Roose Bolton, who was positioned at the crossroads, in order to take Harrenhal. Edmer believed that once Rob returned from his campaign, Tywin could be successfully entrapped between Riverrun and Harrenhal, defeating him outright. To return to the Westerlands, Tywin had to first cross the Red Fork of the River Trident, which Edmer saw as his opportunity to strike. Calling the banners of the River Lords, approximately 8,000 footmen and 3,000 horsemen, Edmer moved to the Trident in order to prevent Tywin's force, which outnumbered the River Lords two to one, from crossing the river. The levies of the Riverlands were organized by Edmer in such a way that every river crossing south of River Run was guarded by a substantial garrison. Lord Jason Malister commanded four southern forts, with Lord Carol Vance taking command of those further upstream. The west bank of the fork was higher than the eastern, and consisted primarily of woodland, allowing them to hide archers and place scorpions to assist in their operations against the Lannisters. Furthermore, caltrops and iron spikes were placed sporadically along the fork, with Edmur keeping his finest knights in reserve in order to join the fray wherever the fighting was fiercest. At the same time, ravens were sent to Rob in order to inform him of the Lannister march and of the events in the Stormlands. The battle began with Lannister probing attacks, attempting to find a weakness in the Riverlord's sound defensive formations. House Malister first repelled a contingent from House Brax during the day, and later that night, another group of Lannister soldiers attempted to take them unawares. The next morning, word reached Edmur that Sir Flemont Brax was defeated six leagues to the south by a combination of archers and scorpions under the command of the Malisters while House Vance also successfully held back a Lannister advance. The front grew quiet until three days later, when Tywin ordered crossings in a dozen places, hoping to overwhelm the defenders, but each of these attacks was successfully repulsed by the Riverlords. Sir Adam Marbrand was forced to retreat three times, Sir Robert Brax was killed in combat, Sir Leo Lefford drowned in his attempted crossing, and Sir Lyle Craighall was taken captive in this fighting. The battle, however, was the fiercest at Stone Mill, where the Lannisters under Sir Gregor Clegane were able to cross the western bank of the ford and make a foothold. They were unable to hold it, however, suffering heavy casualties and eventually being driven back as Edmur's reserve turned the tide, and the mountain, wounded by a dozen arrows, withdrew. Tywin's casualties were in the thousands, and unable to sustain the assault with the current rate of casualties, he drew his forces back, marching to the southeast. Edmer, who lost a handful of soldiers, was triumphant, but little did he know that this unsanctioned battle against Tywin actually spoiled Rob's plans. While Rob was fighting in the Westerlands and Tywin was failing to cross the Red Fork, other players were eager to strengthen their position, and events were transpiring in the southeast. Stannis, who had the smallest army of all the pretenders to the throne, took the advice of the Red Priest, Melisandre, and made his way to the castle he had once defended for his older brother, Storm's End, to lay siege to Renly's seat as Lord of the Stormlands. Stannis and his 5,000 men, 
immediately set up a well-organized blockade of the borderline impregnable fortress in order to draw his brother out. When the news of this reached him, Renly had already reached Bitterbridge en route to King's Landing. In spite of the advice given to him, the young Baratheon immediately split his forces and at the head of some 20,000 cavalry made his way to Storm's End in order to confront his brother and lift the siege. This led to a parley between Renly, Stannis and Catelyn Stark, and unwilling to put aside their differences or consider the pleas of the Stark matriarch, the brothers decided that the battle between them was to begin at dawn the next day. However, events were not to transpire in such a manner. That night, Renly's tent was entered by a black shadow in the image of Stannis, and this shadow cut Renly's throat in the presence of Brienne of Tarth and Catelyn Stark. Although Brienne was blamed for the assassination and hunted by Renly's supporters, the true assassin was the product of Melisandre's magic. With Renly Baratheon dead, the majority of the warriors who had accompanied him to Storm's End now defected to Stannis. However, a fifth of Renly's knights, commanded by Sir Loras Tyrell, made their way to Bitterbridge, refusing to grant Stannis their fealty. The siege of Storm's End was not over yet, as Sir Courtney Penrose, fearing for the safety of Robert's bastard Edric Storm, refused to hand over Storm's End to Stannis. Penrose offered a challenge of single combat, but it was rejected, along with all other options to end the siege. Stannis turned to his most trusted servant, Sir Davos Seaworth, who smuggled Melisandre inside the castle using the skills from his past life. Here the Red Priestess gave birth to another shadow assassin, who made his way into the castle, killing Sir Courtenay, which led to the surrender of the fortress. 60,000 men were now encamped at Bitterbridge, where fierce fighting broke out between those who wished to support Stannis and those who refused to do so, and the ones who just wanted to return home. It continued until the Tyrell vassal, Lord Randall Tarly, took control of the situation, putting many dissenters to the sword. His initial charge gave the pro-Renly forces an opportunity to reform themselves, and Lord Tarly led them away from Bitterbridge, knowing that Stannis was on the way. Still, many joined Stannis, bringing his total strength to around 30,000 men. Tarly's retreat opened up the road to King's Landing for Stannis, and his newly enlarged army and the Baratheon brother started moving towards the poorly defended capital. This proved to be the grimmest point in the war for the Lannisters, as Tywin lost all his gains in the Riverlands, his son was taken hostage, and his home base was scoured. The Crownlands were in chaos, and the ever-incorruptible Stannis Baratheon was marching to take King's Landing, with the clear goal of putting every Lannister supporter to the sword. Although the Vale, Dawn, and the Iron Islands remained neutral, unwilling to commit to any side in times of such uncertainty, the Lannisters were effectively surrounded by enemies. Yet, as sometimes is the case, the defeats on the battlefield would be reversed by the successes on the diplomatic front and general luck. Our story of the War of the Five Kings will continue, and we're planning to cover the battles of many other fantasy, sci-fi, and space opera universes. So make sure you have subscribed and pressed the bell button. Please consider liking and sharing, as it helps immensely. And don't forget to comment. We'll try to read and respond to every comment, as we want to know what you think about this video and which videos you hope to see in the future. This is the Wizards and Warriors channel, and we'll catch you on the next one.